Hey, we're in the book of Zephaniah, as already mentioned. Zephaniah, we're going to look at today the man and his message. And as we look at the man and his message, in the very first chapter of Zephaniah, verse 1, it says, And the word of the Lord came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi. I had to stop right there when I read this. Cushy? Cushy? Wait a minute. The name is Cush. He gooped. Somebody gooped, gooped here. The, the, the name is Cush. Why Cushy? And then I did a little exploring. The word Cush itself, not Cushy, but the word Cush, is used for a region name in Genesis chapter 2, verse 13. It says this about the Garden of Eden, right? And a river of water A river watering the garden flowed from Eden, and from there it was separate into four uh, headwaters. The name of the second river is Gion, and and it winds through the entire land of Cush. Cush is a land. It's a region. Now, this is the pre-flood land, so I'm not exactly sure where Cush was before the flood because the flood changed everything on the topography of the earth. I'm talking about the Noahic flood, okay? And so, but it's a region name. The second thing I found about the word Cush, it's Noah's grandson's name. It says the son of Ham, that was, Ham was Noah's son, but his son's name was Cush, Cush. And so it is a region name found in Genesis chapter 2, and it is now a person's name in Genesis 10, 6. But most frequently, the region known as Ethiopia after the flood is called Cush. Today, in modern times, it would be Sudan. Sudan. Cush is Sudan. In fact, it, it's, Cush is used over 20 times around that. Depends on what translation, they'll, they'll call it something a little differently. But about 20 times it's used for this region in Africa. And this brings me all back to Black History Month. This is Black History in the Bible, all right? So, now Cushy, the word Cushy, e, with the, uh, the little I on the end, Cushy, means Ethiopian. It means uh, Cushite, Cushite in the Bible. Now, it only occurs four times in the Bible, only occurs four times. The word Cushy is used twice for the people of the region of Cush, Ethiopia, or Sudan. It's used for black Africans. That's what his name is it's used for. And, and, the first time it's, it's done, th- does that in 2 Samuel 18, verse 21, it says the Cushites are the Ethiopians. The second time is in Jeremiah 13, 23, it's referred to Cushites and Ethiopians. The word Cushy is used twice for a person's name, twice. And guess what? It's found here in Zephaniah 1, and it mentions the same person in the book of Jeremiah 36, 14. Only one person in the Bible is called Cushy. You say, well, what's the big deal about the letter I being on the end of the name? I mean, this is, what's the big deal here? Here's the big deal. Take the word Israel. The word Israel is Jacob's name. God changed Jacob's name from Jacob to Israel, all right? The word Israel is also used in the Bible for a region and a kingdom of that region, okay? So same way as we found in Genesis, this word is being used. But the word Israeli, put that little eye on the end, means it is a descendant of that man or from that region. So it is a descendant of. Wow, that's really important. The little eye means that they're a descendant of. That's pretty interesting. Likewise, the word Cush is a person's name. The word Cush is a region's name. We just saw that from the Bible. And when you put that little I on the end, you put Cushy, it means it's a descendant of that man Cush or that region of the planet called Cush, which is very, very interesting. Why am I going through all of this? Why call him Cushy? Because Cushy, Cushy because one of his parents was from Cush and he was born with that dominant African gene and so the parents named him Cushy. This is all leading me somewhere. You see, in the very first verse, it talked about this guy being a descendant of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a king. He was a good king, a godly king. He is as, a godly as David. He's compared to King David. He's a good godly king. He has a son, Manasseh. And his son, Manasseh, has a son, Ammon. And his son, Ammon, has a king by the name of Josiah. This is the royal 
line. But Hezekiah also had another son. He had a son by the name of Amaziah. And Amaziah has a son, Gedaliah, and it appears from scriptures that Gedaliah marries a Cushite woman. This is an interracial marriage, folks. Are you getting a picture here? It's not the first one in the Bible. If you were to go back into the book of Numbers, you would find that Moses married a Cushite woman. And Aaron and Miriam got upset about that, and then God put a curse on Aaron and Miriam until they repented of that, because a Cushite, an Ethiopian, today a Sudanese, okay? And as a result, they have a child, and they name their child Cushy. Why would they name their child Cushy? Kind of like when Esau was born. You remember the story in Genesis? Esau was born. He came out. He had hair all over him. All over him. And so they called him Esau. You know what Esau means? Harry. <laughs> Harry. They named him Harry. Well, well, here we got a case. They have a son, and they name him not Cush. I mean, that's a name that's already been used. But they name him Cushite. They name him Ethiopian. They name him Sudanese. They, it's an eth, they're using the ethnos as part of his name because they are proud. They are proud that their son is African born. Wow, is this amazing? This is amazing. They have a son, and his son, his name is Zephaniah. And so Zephaniah is a cousin to King Josiah. Isn't this interesting? It, it reminds me of John the Baptist being a cousin to Jesus. Is this amazing? Zephaniah is a prophet, while Josiah is the king. They both have royal blood, but only one is of the kingly line. The other turns out God calls him to be a prophet. That's all found in this verse. The word of the Lord came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amor Amariah, the son of Hezekiah. This is the longest genealogy given as an introduction to the prophet in all the books of the prophets. Why? I think God wants us to know that this is a black Jew prophet of God. He is cousin to the king. He, he ministers during the reign of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. Josiah was eight years old when he took the reign. Eight years old, oh my goodness. I got saved at eight years old. This guy is reigning as king at eight years old. Is this amazing? Now his dad, Ammon, and his grandfather before him, they were wicked kings. But Hezekiah was a godly king. And so he doesn't want to take him back to the wicked kings. He wants to take him back to the godly king, Hezekiah. And so there's a connection here that uh, jo Josiah is his cousin. Josiah, at eight years old, by the time he's like 18, 20 years old, and he is about 6, 20, he discovers the law of the Lord in the temple, and he has a great revival take place in the land. He had great reformation because whereas his father and his grandfather had replaced worship of the true and living God with idols and idolatry, Baal, Molech, uh, worshiping the zodiac and the stars. And, and they, he says, but along comes Josiah and discovers the word of God. This is why the word of God is so important. I hope you're still reading through your Bible. Still reading through the Bible. You're probably a little bogged down. I got ahead on things, so I'm not exactly sure where you're at, but you're maybe in Leviticus. Leviticus, anyone? It gets a little, little tedious reading over and over the same offerings, right? But hang in there. Hang in there. It is a boring book at times, but it's an exciting book. Exciting book. You get to chapter 16, Day of Atonement. Oh, my goodness. It's great. Anyway, he discovers the law of the Lord. He reads the law of the Lord, and he says, we've got to get back on track with God. So he starts destroying all the, all the high places where they worship false gods. And it's at that time that Zephaniah is his cousin that God actually calls him as a prophet. You see, the word of the Lord came to Zephaniah. And what that means is God spoke to Zephaniah. 
King Josiah has to go to the Bible and read it to get the message from the Lord. The prophet hears directly from God. And so he is called to be a prophet, but a prophet is just a mouthpiece. He then has to proclaim the message that God gave to him. He proclaims that message, and here God has called Zephaniah to be a prophet and his cousin just to be a king. Do you notice how I said that? Just to be a king. Because every day, this guy is in touch with God, and God is speaking directly to him. Oh my goodness. I and mean, we think of kings really high, we should probably think of prophets even higher. He is prophet of God. <clears throat> He's concerned about Cush because in his book, he twice mentions Cush. He includes them in judgment that God is going to bring upon the earth. He says, you too, O Cushites, will be slain by the sword. That's it. Shortest verse in the book of Zephaniah. It's kind of like, I just want you to realize, I'm, I'm not just talking to all of you, I'm talking about to my own. Oh, you need, you need to be right with God. Then when he talks about the restoration that God is going to bring to the earth, he says, from beyond the river of Cush, my worshipers, my sacred people will bring me offerings. You see, in God's plan of redemption, he always included the whole earth. He said, through Abraham, I will bless all generations, all peoples of the earth. I will bless everyone. Through you, all the earth will be blessed. And so he includes Cush in his, his message. So let's turn to his message. We get through verse 1. I know that took a little while to get through one little verse. If I go that way through the whole book, we'll be here for a long time. So we're going to pick up the speed. Here's his message. His message is God is going to judge this world. It's about justice. Not social justice. Divine justice. That includes social justice. Don't get me wrong. But, but he takes it a step further. This is all about divine justice. God is going to judge this world. That's not a message you hear too often today, is it? The message today is make you feel good. Here's a few tips to make you happy. Here's a few tips to make you, and then they go through the Bible and find happy verses. And then they go through the Bible and they find, here's some tips to make you wealthy. And they find verses to make you, make you wealthy. And, and here's, everything is about you. Zephaniah is not like that at all. <laughs> Everything's about him. And listen, God is going to judge the world. You say, where do you see that? I see that in the very next verse. Verse 2. He starts out his message. Here's, here's how he starts his preaching. I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. Uh, he's kind of in your face. Did you notice? In your face. I will sweep away. So I got the broom out there. Now, God's going to sweep it away. You're, you're, he said, all creation is like on home plate, and he's the umpire, and he pulls out the broom, and whoosh, whoosh, you're gone. <laughs> you're gone. Whoa. I will sweep away everything. He said, everything's going down in God's judgment. Wow. He says, again, I will sweep away. I will sweep away. He says this, three times in the opening, God's judgment is certain. Justice is coming. I will sweep away both men and animals, birds and fish. This reminds me of Genesis chapter 1, only it's in the reverse order. God made the birds and fish, then he made the animals, and then he made man. Here he's saying, I'm going to wipe, and he says, I'm starting with you, mankind. I'm going to wipe you away. He says, the wicked will have only heaps of rubble when I cut off man from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. The word cut off is used in several, that expression is used several ways. You can cut off somebody from Israel by putting them outside the camp. Or you can cut them off by killing them. You can cut up, see, the idea here is God is going to judge and there's going to be nothing left, nothing left. Nothing left. Reminds me of uh, the book of Genesis and the flood. God saw the wickedness of man was so great that he said, I'm sorry that I ever made the lot. I'm going to wipe them all out, but one man found grace in the eyes of the Lord, Noah. He was righteous. He walked with God. And so you know the story. He spared him when he 
swept away with a flood the entire earth. It was him and his family. They were all swept away. And what are you saying? Listen, cataclysmic judgment is coming. It's coming. It's coming. I will stretch out my hand against Judah is where he starts. You would have thought, you know, like Amos. Remember when we went through Amos? When Amos started telling about judgment coming, he picked all the nations around Israel, and they're all saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he saved Israel for last. Zephaniah is just the opposite. He says, I want to start with you. (laughs) You who say you know the Lord, I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all who live in Jerusalem. I will cut off from this place. He's going to cut them down. Now for that, I got the sickle out. He's out harvesting. Judgment is coming. God is a just God and justice will be meted out. Justice is coming. Notice what he says here. I will cut off from this place in Jerusalem, in Judah, every remnant of Baal. No, we normally call it Baal. It's pronounced Baal. Baal worshipers, these Baal worshipers. Now, if you were to do a little study on this religion, it's a Canaanite religion. And in the Canaanite religion of Baal, um, he's got a god over him because it's a pantheon. There's a god by the name of El, and then there's Baal. And he's got a consort. Uh, her name is, well, she's got several, or he's got several of them, or she goes by different names. I'm not sure which, and no one is in the Canaanite literature. But her name is Anat. Uh, her name is uh, uh, Asherah. Uh, and uh, she's got other equivalent names. Uh, that's a consort. Now, he is the storm god. In this image that has been archaeologically recovered, and, and uh, you can see that's Baal. And he's got a club in one hand because he's a god of war. And he's got a lightning rod in the other because he's a god of storm. And uh, he is a god of fertility. You say, how did he get all that out of that? Well, he's a god of storm. And if you have rainstorms, it brings uh, the fertilization process to all creation. If you don't have rain, you have a drought. And so they connected all this together. He is a god uh, ultimately of sex. Are you kidding me? This sounds like our culture. Our culture worships sex. They sell products with sex, right? It's just everywhere. Here they worship sex. They worship it. Uh, did you know that the number one thing hit on in the, uh, uh, online on the internet is pornography? The number one search is always for pornography. You know what follows in behind that? Not too very far. Religion. <laughs> Go figure Here they had it. Their religion was sex. It was. They'd have temple prostitutes. Whoa. I mean, you would enter, and they were called virgins. How screwed up is that? Oh, my goodness. This was going on in Jerusalem among God's people, and Zephaniah says, this cannot be. Are you kidding me? God's people? God is going to cut that off. He's going to cut that off. Next, he says, idol worshipers are going to be cut off. The names of the pagans and the idolatrous priests. <laughs> they set up idols and they worship these idols. You know, an idol, according to the book of Colossians chapter 3, says, idolatry, it says, covetousness is idolatry. When you covet, you are actually an idolater. They were coveting the prosperity of the pagans, and so they were looking at their gods. Hey, this pagan Baal worshiper, uh, it seems like his crops are growing. My, my, mine aren't. And so I'm going to follow, follow his god instead of mine. And we got this nonsense going on among God's people. It seems, it was pragmatic, it seemed to work, so it must be right. No. God is true and everything else is a lie that contradicts what God says. Covetousness, anything you covet. I don't know what you covet. You covet a bigger house, faster car. My brother Dave, he had bought a uh, Viper, the, the hot rod Viper. It was one of the early models. It had no safety features on it. It was a hot rod. First time he got it, he bought it on the other side of the state. He's bringing it back. 
He said I wanted to see what it would do. I stomped on it. He said I was going 160 miles an hour, and I still had another gear to go. So I said, Dave, where are you going with a car so fast? Where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? He said, 7-Eleven. <laughs> we want things we don't even need. True? When we want and are greedy, covetous for things that we don't even need, we are idolaters. Whew. Zephaniah is hitting the people right between the eyes. The next one is says, all those who bow down on the roofs of worship the starry host. They worship the zodiac. We still have that today. It's called the horoscope. It's in your newspapers, right? And you find people, they put more trust and confidence in the horoscope, the zodiac, than they do in the true and living God. He tells us this in 2 Chronicles. He, Manasseh, uh, that would have been uh, Josiah's grandfather. He says he, he rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had demolished. Oh my goodness. Hezekiah is a godly king and, and God just does mir miraculous stuff because of his trust in the, in, in the true and living God. And, and he, he's built a sanctuary to the Lord and, but his son comes along and he erects altars to Baal and to Asherah. The Sherah poles were just tall, tall poles, kind of like a telephone pole that had inscriptions on them. And, and, and they worshipped them. He says, listen, they erected those where? We're going to find actually in the temple. He bowed down to the starry host and worshipped them. He builds altars in the temple of the Lord, 12 of them, to the zodiac. And he's worshipping the stars instead of the true and living God. He built altars to all the starry hosts. Oh my goodness, this guy has abandoned the true and living God for the zodiac. So God said, I'm going to wipe them away. I'm wiping them away. Then he says, those who bow down and swear by the Lord and also swear by Molech. Molech. Now, these are the people who say, well, you know, I worship both. I worship the Lord and you know, I worship Molech over here on the side. Molech was a Canaanite deity that, um, I don't know how else to say it, he, he, he was probably the worst of the worst um, because even God directs some, some stay, sayings about him. But what this is, this is compromising worship. Compromising worship. I worship on a Sunday, but it does not affect the rest of my week the way I live. I sing praise to God on Sunday, but on Monday I'm cursing out of the same mouth that all the sweetness came to God. Now I've got this foul language coming out of my mouth at work on Monday. It's a compromise. It's, in fact, this religion was so bad, though. He, God says in Leviticus, say to the Israelites, any Israelite or any alien living in Israel who gives any of his children to Molech. What? They actually sacrifice their kids to Molech. If they do that, they must be put to death. The people of the community are to stone him. You're, the community is supposed to uprise against this. I will set my face against that man and I will cut him off from his people for by giving his children to Molech. He has defiled my sanctuary and profaned my holy name. If the people of the community close their eyes, we're just going to blind ourselves to this. We're just going to say, well, I, I, I'm going to pretend like it doesn't exist. When the man gives one of his children to Molech they will, uh, and they fail to put him to death, I will set my face against the man and his family and will cut off from their people, both him and all who follow him, in prostituting themselves to Molech. Zephaniah is really upset with the people. God is upset because he's really just speaking God's word. This is when you compromise to kill the baby, 
You are not following the Lord. Now, folks, I see a real connection here. And like the prophet Zephaniah, the preacher Dennis sees a connection. Abortion is just a baby that's preborn. We offer up an abortion. How in the world, I'm asking, this is all I'm asking, how in the world can someone who says they are a Christian vote for someone who is pro-abortion, pro-choice, pro-murder? How, how can you vote for that person? It is a compromise, and that's what the people were doing. And Zephaniah steps up and says, listen, I'm not going to dance around this. You were wrong. God is going to judge you. This is an injustice to the weakest of the weakest. Then he says, listen, God is going to judge. He's going to bring about judgment to those who turned back from following the Lord. You see, they started to follow the Lord, but then something got too difficult, and they turned around and went back. They left the Lord. They were apostates. And they neither seek the Lord nor inquire of him. They have turned back. Remember in the first John when we were studying that, it said, if they had been of us, they would not have gone out from among us. But because they were not of us, they went out from among us. And that's what he's saying here. Listen, God is going to judge those who do not stay true to the word. The apostate who turns his back on the true and living God. This all sounds very hopeless, doesn't it? Wow. Say, preacher, thanks a lot. I came to church hoping you'd give me a word of hope. <laughs> and here I feel it pretty crummy. I live in a messed up world. Everybody around me is kind of messed up. I read the news. I watch the news. It's messed up. It's messed up. God is going to sweep away everyone. Wow, that's really encouraging, preacher. Where's the hope? Zephaniah doesn't give it at the beginning of the book. But in the next chapter, he says this. Seek the Lord. Here's the solution. <laughs> Seek the Lord. He's also going to say, wait upon the Lord. That is, serve him. You wait upon him like a waiter. Serve the Lord. Seek the Lord. Serve the Lord. And then at the end of the book, chapter 3. Oh, remember that verse we started with this morning? Oh, it comes at the end of the book. The Lord your God is with you. Amen? Yeah, yeah. The Lord your God is with you. Remember, he's bringing all those judgments on the way. The Lord your God is with you. He's mighty to save. I just want to stop there in this verse. Mighty to save. Kind of reminds me of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. Hey, listen, folks. Judgment is coming. It's coming. God, who is just, is going to judge the whole world but those who know Jesus shall not perish. Wow, isn't that amazing? But have everlasting life, for God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't come into the world to judge me, but that the world through him might be saved. I love that verse. Right there, saved, did you get it? Because in Zechariah 3, 17, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. That's why Jesus came into the world, to save. And if we believe in him, we are not with those who get swept away. He's going to sweep everything. We're like, like Noah. We are in the ark of Jesus. While God is sweeping away all the wickedness, he's preserving those. They do not perish. They have everlasting life. He, he is that the world might be saved. You see, whoever believes in him, Jesus Christ, is not condemned. But whosoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Whoa. Folks, here's the hope. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. Amen? Judgment is coming. You know, we, we live in a truly wicked world. And you just got to say, whoa, God is going to correct it all. But as for me, the Lord your God, the Lord my God, is with me. And he's mighty to save. He's mighty to save. That's if you know Jesus. And you can know him today. And just invite him into your life as Lord and Savior. He'll become the master of your life. Let's pray. Father in heaven. 
This is the word of the Lord, spoken through the prophet Zephaniah, preached through the preacher Dennis. It's the word of God. Lord, I pray if there's one here who does not know Jesus or online watching that does not know Jesus, that right now they would say, Lord, I should be swept away. I'm a sinner like all the rest. But I'm accepting Jesus to have paid in full the price of my sin and to save me from perishing and giving me eternal life. I trust in him. Lord, I know if anyone, anyone prays that to you with a heart of faith, they will be saved. For the Lord our God is with us and he is mighty to save. May we carry that with us this week, O Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.